there are a lot of leaders that have helped the United States recover from the Great Recession of 2008. However, I don't know many that selflessly came out of retirement, not once, but twice, to make an immediate impact on two great organizations, E-Trade and Freddie Mac. I'm, of course, talking about Don Layton, the CEO of Freddie Mac and former CEO of E-Trade. As chairman and CEO of E-Trade, Don oversaw the recapitalization of E-Trade's balance sheet and led a restructuring effort that put the company's online brokerage business back on track. Under Don's leadership at E-Trade, he also helped recruit senior executives and reorganize the management and strategy of the company all in a couple years. At Freddie Mac, Don has overseen the transfer of $1 trillion, that's a lot, in credit risk from taxpayers to private investors. The serious delinquency rate for single family homes has dropped below 1% for the first time in a decade. And over the last 10 years, Freddie Mac has returned $114 billion to taxpayers, nearly 60% more than what they received from the U.S. Treasury. And in the last year, and this is a big impact on people like you and me, they have helped 355,000 first-time homebuyers achieve the American dream, 524,000 families refinance, and probably the most important, 100,000 families avoid foreclosure. I have a lot to talk to Don about. Here are a few of the topics that I plan to explore with him. The benefit of taking a pause during your career to reflect on what's important, how he transformed Freddie Mac over the last several years, What's most critical when turning around a business? He's got, obviously, a tremendous amount of experience. What changes Don sees on the horizon in the mortgage industry? And as always, I love asking questions about leadership advice. He's had an incredible career. My guess is he's got a lot for us. If your company's in existential trouble, the balance is very easy. Move fast. There's no nicety about it. You have no choice. If it's normal circumstances, you have to be a little more balanced about it all. Welcome to the Resilient Podcast, where we hear stories from leaders on crisis, risk, and disruption. My name is Mike Kearney. I'm a Deloitte partner based out of San Francisco. And I'll say I am energized by many of the things that I'm doing at Deloitte. I lead a new way of bringing tech-enabled solutions to our clients called Spark. I lead the Brand and Reputation Venture Fund. I love advising risk executives on how you elevate risk to the C-suite. And I moonlight on this podcast where I get this incredible opportunity to go speak with CEOs, board members, and other leaders about what they have to say about crisis, risk, and disruption. Today, I am in New York City, and I'm really looking forward to speaking with Don. And in doing my research, it became clear that he is a man of deep character. I kept thinking, that this is a guy that's guided by something that is way deeper than his title, CEO, or his paycheck. Shoot, when he became CEO of E-Trade, he requested that all of his 2008 and 2009 incentive compensation be in the form of equity. Don, welcome to Resilient. Thank you, it's great to be here. Don, I always love uh, opening up with a question that in doing my research, I find um, there to be kind of an interesting fun fact or anecdote about somebody. And one of the things I think I've gleaned, and you could tell me if I'm right or wrong, and that is that you have a deep joy um, or you like turning around businesses. My question is, was there a moment in your career where you stood back and you said, I'm actually pretty good at this and it's something I like? Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to do a left turn on you. I don't regard I like myself <laughs> I don't regard myself as a turnaround guy. Okay. But I'll come back to why you think that. Okay. Uh, I I regard myself as a uh, take whatever I do and make it better guy. And as I've gotten more senior, I have figured out that people for whatever reason, some naturally are more stand pat type managers, some are more I'm going to improve what I have managers. I cannot just sit on what I inherit. I have to move it forward. Early in my career, that was largely about building new things in the markets. What became the derivatives business Mm -hmm. was my move from very young, and that got me to be head of all trading and treasury at Manufacturers Hanover, a name long gone, but at that (laughs) point, the fourth largest bank in America. Uh, And I became head of trading and treasury at the age of 37 (laughs) off of that. So I was a builder. then the LDC debt crisis hit and kind of crushed the banks, and we went into merger mode. Manhan and Chemical did the first modern kind of merger of equals to get stronger. Um, Chemical Bank was the fifth largest bank. 
They were located across the street. It was very convenient. Um, and then we did these giant mergers, overlap mergers, every four years. Manhattan Chemical, 91, 92. Then we kind of merged with Slash Boss Chase in 95, 96. Then we bought another guy, and I bought J.P. Morgan in 2000, and then the bank one deal four years later, every four years. And so that was being assigned to take these two businesses. You were from both sides, pure overlap. Get the best of both. Don't just get bigger, get better. And so uh, we did that, and then I got assigned to be uh, to turn around the operating services business. That's custody and cash management and things. Um, and so I was more of just whatever it is, take it and move it forward. The reason why you think I'm a turnaround guy is because after I left Manhan, not Manhan, sorry, J, what was then J.P. Morgan Chase in yep. 2004, uh, off of the Bank One merger, I had been running half the company, half the organization, uh, basically as co-chief operating officer. And then with the merger, Jamie was co- Diamond was coming in as that role. So the other guy and I left after a little while. Um, when you're out looking for a role, and at that point, the only thing worth doing for me was CEO because I'd done everything yep. else. People don't hire from outside to be a CEO. Oh, I have a great company. Everything's fabulous. But I need an outsider, please. Right. They hire outside for turnarounds. That's the strong correlation. So the reason you think of me as a turnaround type person is when you're out, that's who hires you. So that was E-Trade and that was Freddie Mac. But there definitely is a, 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 a through line of restlessness, meaning like you yes. like, it doesn't matter how good or bad something is, I need to make it better. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Yes, uh, some people are motivated by that, by just pure competitiveness. You know, the type who is like in four sports in high school and college and things. Yep. Others I've noticed are more, it's the intellectual challenge or some combination. I'm actually more the intellectual challenge guy. Uh, and so, yeah, I, it is. I cannot sit and just operate. I have to move it forward. So where do you think that comes from? Were there any early experiences that shaped who you are today? Maybe that you could point back and to say, hey, listen, when I was younger, whether it's in college or a kid, here's some things that shaped me. And- yeah. Well, first, I want to tell a little joke. What I am not is the person who planned, you know, to have this happen. A lot of life is just putting one step in front of the other and you see how it goes. I remember driving around looking at colleges with one of my kids. I think it was my younger son. And he's reading from the typical guide on schools. and It's about Harvard. We're about to visit Harvard. And he's reading from it and it says, Harvard is the kind of place where half the students have been planning their Senate run from third grade. <laughs> I'm not that guy. That's, you're not that I'm guy. I'm that guy. I never planned to be CEO. Uh, that was just an unknown thing to me. I just kept pushing forward if there were any anecdotes about high standards uh very high i was i was very good academically from a young age and my father had been my parents both were very smart my mother was one of the very first women to go to business school at city university city college which is now baruch um and uh the family joke was if i got 100 on a test i'd come home and tell my father 100 and the response was what? No extra credit? <laughs> Which, of course, I did to my kids. Okay. Um, but other than that, and I had an older brother, there's a little competitiveness going on, you know, and such. But other than that, I think it's just circumstances and just, and the nurture and nature, I think, is a little more than nature. Absolutely. So um, I have read a lot, and I think you've even commented in some articles that um, your deeper analytical skills is what really differentiated you when you started out. Yeah. Um, Analytical is maybe too vague a phrase because okay. one of my kids is an English major and, you know, analytical writing. I'm not talking. I'm talking about a quant. Okay. Okay. Uh, and before there were quants in Wall Street or that was a recognized thing, I was a quant in You were banking. a quant, yep. Uh, and that's the MIT background. And did you recognize that that would be valuable at that time? Nope. Nope. The only hint I had was that a friend of my father's who had gotten an MBA, who's younger. So my, And he told me, if you got a quant-type degree, like an engineering situation, and then went to, it was Harvard Business School, which is notoriously qualitative, right? you had both ends. And that's ended up what I was doing. I went to MIT. I got two degrees in economics, which is highly quantitative. It's like applied math at MIT. Yep. 
And then I went up the river to Harvard Business School, which is extremely qualitative. So I just kind of fell into it. Now, I went to finance, into finance, which is obviously more mathy, but it, that Greek letter stuff was just the glimmers of a beginning. We're talking 1974 and 75. Uh, and so it was still the old world. So this was early on. But on the other hand, by the time I became a low-level officer, so, you know, four or five years later, um, senior people, the senior people from the bank were coming down to me to do these math things uh, because I didn't break out into a nervous sweat when you saw a Greek letter. <laughs> but when I started in banking, a Greek letter person was a jock. Ah, got it. Not a got quant. It, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> it changed. What, what about when you look at uh, folks coming out of school now or even some of the executives that work for you? Are there any skills that you think are um, undervalued, overlooked, things that maybe people um, should work on? And the reason why I ask this is we get a lot of younger kids that are listening to this. And I think it's always valuable for them to hear what does a CEO value in yeah. terms of skills? Okay. Um, there are the hard skills and there are the soft skills. Quant is about hard skills, and they helped me early on. But as you get more senior, you need more of the soft skills of motivating people, integrating people, uh, motivating them. I also have noticed there are people who are just great engagers. Mm. They work with people well. They can create an excitement. They have some vision. They may, they may have quanti people working for them. They don't need that. I've seen great leaders who are great off of one set of skills and great leaders and other. You complement yourself with other people. But that positive can-do personality, uh, the person who is low maintenance, not high maintenance, there you run into people and go, they're a winner because of all of that, and then they have the skills too. And the people who don't have that kind of personality, who are always high maintenance, difficult to get along with, uh, you got great skills, but eventually it usually doesn't end up too well. I probably mentioned this on, on one of my previous interviews, but the one thing I've always said, now being at Deloitte 25 years, I'd rather be on a tough project, a bad project with a great team that you love working with because they have those kind of characteristics you just talked about versus the best project in the world with people I don't want to work with. Not only, well... That's a tough trade-off if you're 23 and you want to eat next week. <laughs> yeah, true. Got it. Uh, but your observation <laughs> is relevant. It was very relevant to me many years later. So I retired from J.P. Morgan Chase off of the Bank One merger. I was 54 years old. And it was interesting. I got a lot of advice from people on what to do. And this is where you go, oh, my God, advice from all these different people. It turns out it was all the same advice. They were telling me I was like a six-sided peg, and this is what a six-sided hole looks like. I was a certain age. I was a certain title experience. And I had a certain kind of net worth because of how well we were paid. And um, I went back, and you think, what do I want to do? You put your feet up on the porch railing, back, the railing on the back porch and go, what do I want out of life when I don't need the money? You're in a rut. I got to right. eat. I got to get a job. I got to have a house, kids. It's past that. And uh, one of the things you decide in that circumstances is I only want to work where I like the people I'm working with. It is definitely not worth it to work with people you don't like. Same comment, just different type of life when I discovered it. I'm going to go there. I was going to actually ask you this yeah. later because you have a great quote, um, which I love. And I've got a few questions, which is um, I'm going to quote you. Uh, Semi-retiring gave me a chance to become a little more philosophical yes. and think about giving back and helping others. Yes. Can you elaborate even a bit more on that? Because yeah. I think that's – here's one of the things that I think oftentimes people in business um, are impacted by, and that is we're going 100 miles an hour. And the ability to really deeply step back and think um, about you know your career, what you want to do, is a challenge. So maybe if you could just touch on that a bit yes. more in that time of your life. Uh, I developed a phrase to describe exactly what you're talking about. It's the rut. Mm. Again, you know, you're 22, 24, you get out of school and go, I'd like to eat, I need a job. I'd like the house and, I'd, and the kids come along and financial security and you're in the rut and you're running so fast uh, since the jobs you're talking about usually are not exactly nine to five low stress jobs. And you're in the rut and you just stay in there. In my case, with the last merger and leaving, 
and again, my age, and because I had made enough money, you don't need to worry about money anymore. Okay, it's a great position to be in that age, but I was. You then literally, literally get to go at that age. Well, if I had been born a Rockefeller or a Kennedy, and I had that kind of family money, what would I have done? Well, forget the philosophy of what I might have done. At this stage, what do you want to do with yourself? Right, going forward. You know, do you want your legacy to be, I went to lots of budget meetings? Answer, of course, is no. Uh, you know, what do you want to do? Where's your value added to the world and things? And I was, uh, as a quant guy and in the rut, I had never philosophized. I, you know, I, I have a quant education. They didn't, <laughs> That's they, not who I am. Yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> I didn't do that. And it was really quite interesting. Uh, uh, my choices were constrained some because uh, we had kids late. So when I retired at 54, my kids were 11 and 14. Mm. So you couldn't do the travel the world thing or a kind of, you know, all, all those kind of things. You had to be a good role model for, sure. and it's my case, two boys and such. Uh, so you didn't want to hang around the house doing nothing. Uh, certainly that's bad. And so you did have this notion of what do I want to do? And I explored foundation work. I explored uh, other kinds of nonprofit work. I went and competed for a big job down in Washington. I didn't get it, but the competition process, the process of competing for a high level appointed position was both educational and scary. Mm. Uh, and I came back to uh, my real value of the world is, to, is finance and running financial things. Um, but, and we'll come back to this later, uh, from a year in college, I had always had a little bit of this dream of being the dollar a year man. <clears throat> now, do you know what a dollar a year man is? It's an old phrase. I, I'm going to say no, because I think probably a lot of people listening okay. may not know. So yeah. A dollar a year man is a phrase. I think it was most commonly used before World War II mm. <clears throat> about someone who either was born to wealth or was successful in business and then said, I'm done. I'll go into public service and earn one dollar a year. Got it. The most famous early one in American history, Ben Franklin, who retired from his printing business and went off and did all his government stuff, but living off the printing business. Uh, the most recent example right here in New York City was Mike Michael Bloomberg, Bloomberg yep. who took one dollar a year. And so, uh, one of the other things the 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 whole when. Freddie Mac opportunity came up, and it's restricted compensation. I regarded it as public service in a sort of convenient commercial form. I, I didn't need the money, and so I was happy to take the lower sal the fixed salary, uh, low salary. But my quid pro quo with the government people is I get to do government type type work. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I'm in the room when you do policy right. things. I don't get a vote legally, but I get to say something because I know the field, and that has worked out. So I'm an extremely high price dollar a year man or a very low price CEO, depending on how you want to define it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really curious. And, and if there's any examples, I think it would be great. But my guess is that the way you operated as a CEO or operated as an executive, let's just say, um, probably changed materially when money wasn't the driving force or factor. Not that I don't even think money yeah. has ever been probably your driving force, no. but it was not even really a consideration at this point in time. Has it changed you, do you think, as a leader? Well, uh, let me, the answer is it doesn't stand alone, but let me give you a little package okay. here. Going in to run Freddie Mac, uh, so I wasn't doing it for the money because there's no stock options, there's no upside mm -hmm. and, for, for me. Um, it's The two GSEs are such a large part of the housing finance system. You, you By fixing yourself and change things, you can improve the whole system. But my legal fiduciary duty while Freddie Mac is in this weird legal status called conservatorship, is in fact to the government, mm -hmm. to the particular part of the government that is the conservator. And that's a rather obscure agency called the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is our regulator. So I didn't have any conflict. Trying to do the right thing for the system and the right thing for Freddie at the same time was the objective. As opposed to if my fiduciary duty had been to shareholders Se separately, 
uh, not to be too crude about it, but my job was to engage in lobbying and all the usual legal tricks to snooker the government right. to make life good for us, but not necessarily good for the country. Total alignment because of the fiduciary duty legally with my objective of create a better housing finance system. And our, in fact, our corporate strategy is the two parts. It's a better Freddie Mac and a better housing finance mm-hmm. system. And we have tried to do everything so it's both. It's not one versus the other. And I'm not an apologist for the old GSC system. It was one versus the other in the mm-hmm. old days. What about when you uh, came into E-Trade? Um, and during your time there, you had some significant success. But yeah. what I'm curious about is, because you turned it around fairly quickly, at least from an outsider's perspective, were there any key decisions that you made early yeah. on? And the reason why I ask this is, there's a lot of executives that are out there that are faced with similar type challenges, maybe not to the extent that you are, but that are coming into a turnaround situation and they need to make decisions quickly. Yeah. If you could just talk a bit about maybe some yeah. learnings or some key decisions that you made. Yeah. Well, I'm going to start first with how I fell into E-Trade. I wasn't looking for that. Uh, a woman I knew in business was on their board and called me up one day and went, we're in trouble. E-Trade is the first firm you've ever heard of that the financial crisis crushed. Yep. While they're an online brokerage, they, the cash in brokerage accounts and the value of that cash is one of the prime revenue sources in uh, retail brokerage, mm-hmm. whether it's online or old style, doesn't matter. They took and invested it via an affiliate thrift in mortgages. Mm-hmm. And as the budget pressures got bigger, riskier and riskier mortgage type assets. And then some analyst went one day and went, what would now be called OMG. (laughs) This stuff is not worth what it really is on the books. This stuff is cratering. Right. I'm talking some slice and dice CDO positions. I mean, all sorts of things. That created a run on the broker, not a run on the bank, a run on the broker. People went, I don't want my money in this brokerage. So they took, they closed their accounts, took their money. And so they had a liquidity drain roughly akin to what a run on the bank would be. Um, And she said, we, we, the board need our own advisor, not a lawyer, a business finance person. So I said, that'll be fun for a month or two. Right. And I went and did that and it got, they were trying to sell the company or recap it. There was a big recap, partial recap. Obviously, part of the deal was to fire management that had put in this position and uh, uh, the CEO. And the board chair was a very elderly person who lived far away who didn't, wasn't very, so the, I stepped in as board chair. And it was, go find a new CEO. Uh, I learned a lesson. It's very hard to find a CEO when your company is, is heading downhill rapidly. So I ended up stepping in as CEO under a two-year contract. It was not looking to be a long-term career deal. Because they were in trouble, there was no ifs, ands, or buts if they were in trouble. There was no, are we really in trouble or not? You know, this is past that point. And so I sold off everything outside the core business quickly. I sold a Canadian brokerage subsidiary for a price probably five times what I would have sold it for 12 months later. Hmm. They had... Very silly for a company of small size. Two decent-sized corporate jets. We sold them off. A year later, it would they would have had zero value because with the financial crisis coming, people aren't buying corporate jets. Everyone, it was a glut of these right. things. Was it? Was it? So, what advice would you give to somebody? Obviously, it's very different circumstances, yeah. but in a turnaround, it sounds like there are a couple key items. Like one is. <clears throat> Um, obviously making sure you have right management. And then the other one, I think, is making quick decisions. Yeah. But if, okay. There's, when you, when you, I talked about being a pro-change person. I can't right. just sit. Right. There's a cost of change. You have to be judgmental of the speed. And, cause, you know, if you, oh, I don't like, the, the manager's not good. Well, guess what? You fall back six months. Right. If you have a, have to get someone new in and they learn and everything. So there's always this balance. If your company is in existential trouble, the balance is very easy. Move fast. There's no nicety about it. You have no choice. If it's normal circumstances, you have to be a little more balanced about it all. Uh, 
but not in abnormal circumstances. And what's your perspective? So let's say it's not as acute as you were in that situation, but I've got some clients that, you know, some industries are being disrupted. They know they need to change, but yeah. maybe the time horizon's a little longer. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on change because you actually just touched on kind of change and impact on culture. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'll come back to my theme of uh, pro change. You need skills. You can't uh, 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 you need to know where you're going. You need people who cooperate or a good team. But that balance of defensiveness, holding back, uh, I want more information, more information, more information. What is it? Analysis, paralysis. Yeah. Um, the CEO has to know where they are on the spectrum of this change has to be fast versus more cons- fast with understanding you'll make more mistakes maybe, yep. but the upside you need too versus it can be slower because the cost of taking longer is small. If you're in an industry being disrupted by technology, you're back to the you need to move fast even if you make mistakes because you go slow you're being run over. That's interesting. Okay, so you need to know where you are on that spectrum. If um, uh, What's an industry heavily... Dis- if you were a newspaper company eight years ago, you should have moved fast because all that happened was value of your franchise declined, right? It's things like that. That's why I, I actually interviewed uh, Jim Maroney two years ago. He was the president of the Dallas Morning News and their mm-hmm. whole company. So... I heard a lot about that and what they had to do. Absolutely. Jeez, Jeez. Um, uh, if you know anything about the newspaper business, the biggest source of profits was the old classified, classified ads. Too. You know how much revenue they get from that now? Not much. Zero. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Zero. There's like, <laughs> yeah, I won't call out the companies, but yes, there's many that do that now. So what about, I read a really funny story, um, I think early on in your tenure at E-Trade, um, where I guess there was a lot of noise. I think it was the run on the accounts maybe, but it was really being kind of propelled by maybe not social media at the time, but kind of the 24-hour news cycle. And I think, yes. it, I don't want to say it caught you off guard, but you certainly didn't think that the information... Yeah, this yeah. was before I got there. Oh, this I was, was, okay. Yeah, this was what caused them to go into crisis mm. to look to do a recap. And I that's when I joined the board as an advisor when they were in the midst of that going, what the hell is going on yep. here? Um, but what I learned afterwards, so this one, ad, uh, I think a cell site, Wall Street equity analyst yep. said these things, these people have a hidden loss. Published it and it took off like wildfire. Now, one thing about, uh, while you may go, it's not social media, uh, this was online brokerage. If you're the typical person with a, you know, who, who, what's the weighted average, typical classic brokerage cap person, someone in their 50s and 60s, mm-hmm. they're working, they're not a day trader trader type or quick traders and everything but the online brokerages were the more the quick trader right. types and this was yahoo finance page was there and motley fool was there yeah. and all these early days of the pre-social media with the finance so people were writing little web postings and everything uh and so it took off early in the apps even in the absence of official social media that was it was definitely internet tied because a lot of their, their customer base was very internet oriented and they looked at all these gossip things and and such so it spread like wildfire it wasn't a report that someone read and over a few weeks they considered it just took off so a lot has changed obviously then yes. since then how do you as a ceo manage i guess through these 24-hour news cycles social media that change the way that you operate or think the answer is modestly but here's where i'm in a very fortuitous position yep Since we're under the control of the government, part of the rule is keep your head down and your profile low and don't say anything controversial. So I am able to be only on the fringe of that media circus (laughs) and and the 24-hour news cycle. We have it some, but not a ton, only because of this weirdness of conservatorship. So I'm not out making speeches about social things. Right. The problem is, if I say something, am I talking for the government or not? And it's confusing, and it looks like you are. So we're, we keep low profiles, and the speeches are all much more, I'll call them street business, uh, and we're not allowed to do a lot of advertising or anything except sort of technical educational things. So the profile is low except for the in straight industry things. 
as an observer, however, and at the fringes, it, the 24-hour news cycle is really tough. Um, besides the you're always on and you always have to expect a phone call with they're going to print this tomorrow, except that, um, see, I'm showing my age, they can print this tomorrow. They this is going right to now. appear online <laughs> in three hours. Right. <laughs> it's different, you know. Um, and um, you have to deal with that once in a while. And then you have the whole problem of what do I say? Do I say something defensive? Does it make it worse? But we've had very few of those because of the nature of conservatorship. I don't have I don't have activist investors. I have the government. Okay, <laughs> you know it's a very different environment. That this way. is a nice segue. So, Freddie Mac, yes. you came out of retirement a second time. Yes. Why? Like, what drew you to that? Um, I want to take you back to that dollar a year man. Yep. If Freddie Mac had been a classic CEO, hype-paid job, I probably would have told them, go away. Hmm. Uh, I mentioned I had, I, I, my kids were young when I first retired. I was going empty nester then. The world was my oyster. You know, this is the let's travel, let's build the house in Florida for the winters. All this kind of stuff was on the table. But, I re but this was the dollar a year man situation. Uh, I did mention I competed for a government job. Yep. It was Deputy Secretary of the Treasury back in 2000, I'll say, five and six. Mm. That's a core job. And, and it, it, you had to really stiffen your spine to take, to take a job like that. I got more nervous as it went on because you're in the political maelstrom and it's not fair. And you, your reputation is at risk because people will throw mud at you. Right. Sometimes just made up, not because you, just because they politically disagree with your positions. So you're in the kitchen and it has heat. The Freddie Mac job was almost perfect. You get to be in the center of the actual housing finance system. But all politically sensitive decisions are made by the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, but the joke is, what do they do at Treasury every day? This was running a company. It was familiar to me. It was a commercial format. Right. So I thought it was the perfect combo of daily life being right up my alley as opposed to how to deal with the Senate Banking Committee. Why, well, you know, you have to learn these things right up my alley. And yet I could be in on the non-political part of policymaking about the housing finance system. So it's almost the best of both worlds. That to me, yeah. to me, fitting me, it was yep. the best of both worlds. I do want to give you one piece of background. When I say the housing finance system, people just kind of blank stare. Let me put it this way. Residential mortgages in this country, there are $11 trillion worth. The entire base deposit base of the entire FDIC insured banking system, I think is only 12 or 13 trillion. Wow. This is monstrous. It is unbelievable amounts of money sloshing around. It is not, Freddie Mac is not like a regular company. Fannie Mae are not like regular companies. They're sovereign size, they're government size, because you're doing something for the whole economy this way. So we have $2 trillion in assets. I mean, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and since they're all mortgages, that's 20%, almost 20% of the market. That's what's going on. So it's of large impact. Um, how should I, in human terms, you know all the phrase, the biggest item on your budget is housing. It's the mortgage payment or the rent payment. Absolutely. Multiply that by every American. That's why it's such a large number. Uh, when people talk about credit cards, or auto loans, those are a little over a trillion dollars each. We're 10 times that size. Can, can you talk? Um, so this uh, affects yeah. everybody in large size. Yeah, and the numbers are staggering. I was going yeah. through them in advance. Can you talk about what Freddie Mac was before the crisis or maybe before you came in? Because yeah. I think it's actually changed oh, yeah. uh, quite a bit. And I don't think a lot okay. of people have I'm, an appreciation. Yeah, I'm going to go away from business here and talk the unhappy combination of business and politics. Okay. Uh, the housing finance system in America has extremely high government involvement. Depending upon your definition, the government is directly involved in maybe 70 to 75 percent of the mortgages in America. It's a lot of history. The banking system didn't finance houses very well in the 1920s, so the Depression came in, the government got heavily involved, and more and more. And so it was well-meaning. Uh, the problem was the design of these things were not the greatest. 
government interventions, certainly as the decades went on. Mm -hmm. And so what you ended up with is a system with defects and all the special interest. So much money is sloshing around. Lobbying and politics played a very large role. This is not new news. There are whole books written about right, this. Right. Just go to Amazon you'll, and, and, you know, put in, you know, American mortgages or something, and you'll see from the titles and, and such. So the system and uh, was very, is, it was and still is highly politicized to all these interests trying to get their hands on some of the cash moving around. Um, the GSEs were controversial, especially near the end, yep. highly controversial in Washington, highly politicized, and were regarded as sort of half a company and half a political machine extracting and protecting subsidies from the government. That is a correct characterization. And so they had a lot of executives who were revolving Washington types who weren't so much finance executives as they were Washington types. Mm. That's the way they ran. That was the reality when they were taken over by the government, that ended because there's lobbying is prohibited. So I do no lobbying. Yep. Um, and uh, that was and, and you that was quite a change in your whole thinking. So these companies, in my personal view, were pretty mediocre competitive commercial companies. They were great Washington machines for subsidies. Uh, and so the books that report them that way, to a fair degree, are true. Mm -hmm. um, they then went into the financial crisis, and it was the foreclosure crisis, the, the tsunami wave of foreclosures. So they were kind of deer in headlights dealing with this and with the government involved and everything. I got there when that was starting to subside, and then what was the blank field in front of you was, now what? And that's where I got to play a role of, let's build a normal, competitive company that can prosper in an unpoliticized normal system because you're efficient you're innovative you're taking advantage of technology if you ask a typical banker in america today what's the most backwards part of the consumer finance system in america they'll say the mortgage system so don can you yeah. maybe just back up a bit and, mm -hmm. and maybe just note a couple kind of uh, examples tangible things for people to get their mind around as to what changes have happened just because it sounds like, obviously, under your leadership, and then also, obviously, as a result of going to conservatorship, a lot's changed. Yeah, I'm going to give you two examples with a little bit of color around them okay. that are very different. One is very understandable by an average person. The other one's a little more galactic. Okay. The first one understandable is uh, when you go in and get a uh, – when you buy a home and you want to get a mortgage um, from anyone, whether we buy it or not, you need an appraisal, right? Right. Uh, and it, we figure the average appraisal in America costs $500. An appraisal consists of someone coming around, looking at your house, taking pictures of other comparable houses in the neighborhood, the values. And you've seen, if you've ever seen these reports, they show the comparable houses. Right. It's a technique that is sometimes called the gold standard, but the actual history is it's an adequate technique, no better. There are a lot of accusations of inflated appraisals, and inaccurate appraisals and fraudulent appraisals. So it's, a, it's an adequate system that's been built on. Um, it's the modern world. We have competitive people. We have fancy techie people. And, I, uh, uh, and we came up with a big data-based way. Hmm. We said, we won't need an appraisal for houses where the circumstances meet the following criteria, which is we figure is about 15%. That's one five. Yep. We'll just do our own estimated value off of available data sources. Interesting. Okay? And if you think of data and Zillow and everything that's available, now I'm going to use an extreme case. If we know what apartment 6A and 8A are valued at because they sold, it really isn't that hard to figure out what 7A is. Right. Okay? Um, so uh, we announced that and put that in. We got approval from the government. Um, that's a kind of change we've engineered. The color I'm going to add about it, of course, is the real estate appraisers were not real happy with that. Of course. Because it's a revenue stream loss. So you do have to have, then the government agency that controls this then had to have the discussions with Congress of why this was a good thing 
and it was not the empire, the, the republic was not going to fall because uh, the appraisal industry was had a, a, a little disruption like our, we oh, talked about, like our classified ad yeah. newspapers. And this is the way it is. But that's why change is hard in mortgages because of all these interest groups. Is that what's holding it back from going above 15%? No, that, no. no that's the technology. That is the technology. Yeah, yeah that, that's all we'll come. Maybe someday we'll, there'll be a, uh, more data and things, but so far it's just uh, targeted at that. Interesting, because I would have thought it would have been higher than 50. If you just have said, hey, what well, percentage? Well, given we're estimate? taking the credit risk of these mortgages, you want right. some track record before you go too far. That's right? a fair point. Okay. So one of the... Um, so that was one change. That's right. I actually okay. didn't share a second. The galactic right. one is um, uh, the two biggest financial crises since World War II were all centered on mortgages, if you hadn't noticed. Mm -hmm. The recent one and the thrift crisis of the late 80s, which cost the government at the time uh, about $135 billion, which in the late 80s, early 90s was a lot of money. Um, part of the reason for this is the government in helping the housing system engineered all these what are called model lines, financial institutions that are just mortgages. Mm -hmm. The two GSEs, us and Fannie, home loan banks, and remember, we had an entire parallel banking system of thrifts, SNLs and savings banks. 80% of the assets had to be mortgages. So whenever that asset class caught a cold, the concentrated monoline institution got pneumonia. Right. And now you had the collapse of the thrifts, and uh, this time the collapse of lots of things. So uh, one of the ways to get out of this is developing what are called credit risk transfer. Let's securitize the credit risk instead of sitting on Trillion, there was five trillion dollars of one asset class mortgages in two companies. This is against normal design of a financial system for stability. You don't concentrate risk; you disperse risk. Yep, yep. This was the exception because of this helping housing history. So well-meaning, but when you look at it in retrospect, you wish they had done it differently. Credit risk transfer, which Freddie Mac led the development of, everybody knows she knows that is instead of us sitting and holding it, we take and redistribute it out to the marketplace, largely bonds, some insurance contracts. And of new flow in, 80% of the credit risk is going out the back door on these things now. So as the portfolio turns over, which takes about a decade, we will fundamentally have taken this giant systemic concentration of risk, which is Poor design is a systemic risk to the system, and we will have solved the problem. Essentially put it out into the market. Okay, is there well, some numbers that you could throw around this, meaning um, the size it was before, maybe what the numbers well, are now? We, uh, Freddie Mac by itself had uh, the credit risk on uh, single-family mortgages at that time about $1.7 trillion. Wow. Yep. Uh, we also have multifamily. That's a industry phrase meaning apartment house right, lending. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so about 1.7 trillion and uh, about a third of the risk has been dispersed. That's $600 billion worth. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, again, the new flow is about, is about 80% going out. So as the People take new mortgages and pay the old ones off. The average life's about 10 years. Then this one-third will creep up. You know, we figure by 2022, it'll be about getting close to 60%, two-thirds-ish. Wow. And we'll just keep going. So uh, these, uh, when I say $600 billion, uh, and here I'm just estimating, maybe you would know as well as I do, that's probably larger than all but about three banks in America maybe four. And that's just our numbers. That's just your numbers, yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, you've talked about that there's um, been a lot of change within the mortgage industry, we'll just say, but there's a lot of exciting change in the future. Mm -hmm. Can you touch on what, what you see in the future? Yeah, so here's this, uh, listen, we're in a general era of disruption. There's two kinds right. of disruption. The media, of course, focuses rightly to a large degree on uh, technology-based disruption. But the other thing going on is just less industries are more competitive and less cartel thinking than they used to be. Business models are changing. Technology is sometimes part of it. Uh, uh, think about 
the category killers like a Home Depot coming in versus buying all your stuff at a department store right. or the local hardware store uh, and such. So there's just lots of business model changes have been accelerating. Uh, they're uh, funded by venture capital, stock market. It's not just tech. It's lots of things. Um, so here was an industry that was pretty backwards because everybody protected their turf with lobbying and a lot of quasi-cartel behavior <clears throat> in the industry. I'm sorry, that's the reality. Yep. Uh, uh, and the GSEs, Freddie and Fannie, as, more, as much or more than anyone. And, and it's, it's exciting is that all, that all that stagnant years, we get to make up fast. So it's business models like doing credit risk transfer rather than sitting on it. By the way, it doesn't take a lot of IQ to sit on all this credit risk. You have to actually engage more brain power to get it out and sell it to the market. Sure. Um, technology. Here's this paper-based industry. Just ter- the documents will follow in three months. This should be something where you know it's all online and you uh, your your closing is that your thumbprint on the iPad. Do you see that coming? Something. The answer soon? is uh, soon. No, but we're moving there at a reasonable pace okay. now, and we are doing as much as anyone to lead it. I mentioned the appraisal item. Yep. There are just the processing of the mortgages between us and mortgage lenders is being electronified in leaps and bounds now. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, their people can be online and <clears throat> put the put the things in and uh, they can know whether mortgage be approved. How about, remember when you had to deliver your copies of your tax statements be, to show your income? Yeah. The W-2 and but the tax <laughs> statements? Yeah. yeah. Now you just, no, you, you know, you just need their permission. Right. And you can get most tax statements online. Right away. You yep. don't need it. So it's all this kind of technology to be efficient, you need competition. You need a competitive mindset to do that as opposed to the old cartel mindset. Well, if Fannie doesn't do it, I won't do it. And they look at us and go, well, if they don't do it, I won't do it. Now we're both doing it and the industry is moving forward rapidly. It was so backwards, It's there's a lot of wood to it's chop. Now, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of late need and now it's actually coming yes, to yes. fruition. And now. so we're not bl- blazing paths in a broad sense, but for mortgages, it's a lot of change. Uh, we do feel for our customers, the lenders. They are facing a lot of change because they have to make change systems. They have to do stuff. Uh, plus, they, of course, have many requirements for the government that requires changes and systems things. So uh, there is a, 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 an issue of the uh, digestibility, the pace of change by the industry broadly. But at least we're moving. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to kind of go back to some of the turnaround mm-hmm. um, considerations. And, and the one that I'm interested in, we talked about kind of uh, your perspectives on uh, what's critical in a turnaround. We've also touched on culture and people. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about, though, how do you how do you change kind of the mindset or how do you lead a large group of people that have very different perspectives that to a certain degree, their livelihood is impacted by the changes in, you know, that are happening in these organizations? How do you bring them along? Is there any any guidance or any perspective that you could share? Um. I'm going to say, I'm going to give you some guidance, but I don't think it's any different than it's the standard guidance. Okay. Um, you have to have a view of where you're going. You have to have an ability to articulate it in easily digestible ways. Long erudite paragraphs are not the way to do it. You need the short, punchy, here's where we're going. Uh, sometimes you have to circle around on that. You try some things and some things work and then you find others. And you have to get out and repeat it frequently, but you have to also be visibly taking actions in that direction. One of the most interesting things in companies, and I'm not sure I've ever seen this in the book, is morale drops when there's change. But I tell people there's two kinds of morale going down. There's good, bad morale and bad, bad morale. Bad, bad morale is when it's heading down because it's drifting and they're, they don't know where they're going. Good, bad morale is when it drifts because you're doing change that will make it better, and then it's go, it turns up. You're building the turnaround. People, people love change intellectually, but they always want their job. They, they like change, change. Uh, theoretically, but when it impacts yeah. their lives. So I have yeah, to tell they, you a little yeah. story on that uh, more broadly. 
So one of these efforts to reform the system was being run through uh, Congress, and uh, the leaders of it was called Corker Warner was Senator Corker and Senator Mark Warner. Yep. Uh, and I was in a meeting with their staffs and either one or both of them I don't remember anymore. And uh, someone asked the staff person, uh, "What do the small lenders say?" There's a small lender. There's several small lender organizations. And the staff person goes, Senator, their message was simple. They said, we love everything you're doing. Just make sure none of it changes anything for them. <laughs> that, uh, that was the large That's version much, yeah. of this. The small version of this is true. So you have to get out there and repeat it, come up with the phrase that resonates, but t- take actions. And it's a tough time until the the – benefit of the changes show up and then morale turns up you have to be willing to take the hassle of the downturn if you try to keep everybody happy every instant you will never make any change whatsoever well in that you've said a couple things that i think are important is one is you got to get out ahead of it you got to communicate simply and transparently right and you got to communicate a lot and you probably also need to help them understand where you're going and kind of right. how they fit into that. So while it may be painful on the downslope, right. they at least know what the vision of where this is going. And I right? was willing to get up and say the company was too dedicated to the politics and the subsidies and not enough to the commercial being a commercially competitive company. We're out of the politics and subsidies business. We're into creating a competitive commercial company that can hold its own in the marketplace we don't know what's going to happen in our future, but chances are there'll be less subsidies and less politics. So let's be ready for come out. I also was a little intellectual about it where I went. I found some examples. Anyone know any company that was sort of protected from competition in the past, whether from government or not, and then they were exposed to competition? Usually the companies do very poorly. My government protection example was the airlines. Before they were deregulated by Alfred Kahn, they were they all had protected market shares in each airport, and then it was thrown to competition. On average, those people have gone bankrupt twice as they try to become competitive companies. That was one. The other was no government involved. The classic case, and I handed the book out to my senior manager by Lou Gerstner. The classic case was the old IBM had such protected market share from its historic position that when technology changed, it collapsed. And Lou, who I knew, who I do know, uh, and dealt with in the day, <clears throat> he wrote his book, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? <clears throat> and there's just great anecdotes of how IBM would come fat and dumb off of its protected market. And I went, we're going to be the one that comes out, is going to be w- set to do well, as opposed to delaying all the changes until the last possible second. There is so much that we can unpack here. But the yeah. one thing that I think is extremely interesting that I think is a powerful leadership technique is the ability to use story absolutely from other instances that people can wrap their mind around really quickly. Like I, I know because I fly all the time. I actually have some airline clients, so I've seen kind of the downside of, of deregulation many years later. And so it's sticky. And so they could put themselves in that position. Like, I see where I play in this story, and I don't want it ending up like that. That, There's uh, a gentleman. uh, He's since retired. He and I, whenever we get together, the meeting would always go over because we're notorious storytellers, so we tell each other stories. (laughs) Uh, Yes, this is part of making abstract strategic concepts don't work. You have to make it real to the middle people in the middle and in the bottom that why we are doing change, why the pain is worth it. The gain will be worth it from the pain. Yep. And so you have to articulate that and you have to take decisions. You can't do the, you do the pain, but not me. I had to be willing to, I had to take the actions to let senior people go who were just stuck in the past. The only other comment I was going to make, um, once again, we can talk about this piece forever, but my guess is some of these things that you are changing, probably in the organization, people have been talking about for years, like why do we operate in the way that Absolutely. we do? And so you almost, in some regards, are unlocking you know, the desire yes. of the organization as There's, well. So my direct reports are almost all outsiders. Yeah. But the person chosen to be the inside candidate to succeed me is the, the one of the two long-term employees. 
He was waiting to be liberated. Others were waiting to be liberated. Uh, the other analogy I like to use is there's a thin man out inside the fat man just waiting to get out. <laughs> and, Why are we all laughing? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I got more to laugh about than you guys. And so when I talk about Freddie was too political, I go, there was a lot of good stuff. But at the top, it was too much politics right. and subsidies. Let's liberate these things. And again, they're always ner- nervous. But yeah, the best people have been liberated and they do great. I'm going to pivot to some leadership questions. It's right. actually part of my favorite um, aspect of, of these interviews. Yeah. And I'm going to share a quote. I love quoting you. Um, and, and actually, this one really stood out because I never heard a CEO talk about it in this context. And your quote is as follows. The easiest thing about being a CEO is you're not in charge of the business. You're in charge of people who are in charge of the business. Right. Maybe if you could just share a bit, and I've got a couple questions on that, but 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 what drove that insight, that quote yeah. from you? I'm sure there's something behind it. Very well. I have not been involved in organizations, which I'll call are kind of just a single little business where, you know, the CEO was also head of the business and there was a the head of sales and a head of manufacturing or whatever. I've always been involved in companies where there are multiple business lines right. in banking, there's the credit card business separate from the FX business and, and just different things. So this came to me in a realization. So I had moved up. I was made at an early age, head of trading treasury. And uh, when I got moved up from money, my, there were three trading and treasury divisions. There were three mm-hmm. divisions. Yep. And I got moved up to be head of all of them. So... To replace me as head of the one of them, I picked someone who'd been running, and it had about five, one of the divisions that had about five businesses. I'm still friends with him. And he moved up to run this. And he came to me very frustrated, like a month or two later, of I'm struggling to get around the people below me to get my hands on the businesses. And that's where I went, you're not running those businesses. They're running those businesses. You're just running them. And you're not supposed to be on those businesses like you were when you were running your little unitary business. And so that's the kind of realization that you picked up on. Uh, The higher up you get, the more you are managing a team of leaders who need a significant amount of discretion to, to be leaders themselves. If all they are is order takers doing you telling all these micro things, that's not gonna last very long. No one has that capacity. They're also demotivated. So don't extrapolate this that everybody's supposed to be a business head with a lot of discretion to make choices. If you get high enough up, you're running business heads who need a fair amount of discretion. You have to have an agreed strategy. Yes, you're supervising them so the big choices you're in on and to and, and such, but you can't just treat them as order takers. They, ha- they have to be business heads. So I have the head of the single family guarantee business. I have the head of the markets business. You need the, you need people like that. It's it's a certain mindset. What I and I totally agree with you. And I don't think many leaders would disagree right. with this premise. But it's almost it almost would dictate how you look at your day, the things that you do. And what I would argue mm-hmm. is you probably then consciously think about coaching these individuals and giving them advice yes. and guidance and building them up as leaders versus my mindset's on the business, which I think is a fascinating small difference. So this is different than just saying you should empower your people. Exactly. When they're running a business, they need a fair amount of discretion to make the trade-offs. Now, let me give you another example of of this. When I got to Freddie Mac, when they got in trouble, the reaction by the succession of CEOs before me was centralized. So no one could run their business. Everything had been pulled away. Think of of like... um, uh, a robot, but the heart is actually, there's a long wire over to the next room. The heart's over there yep. and, you know, the motors are over there and, and, but they had, the, they had the shell. And so, uh, I had to reorganize and pull it back so they could run a complete business that every decision didn't have to be second guessed and, and, and a collaboration with somebody in another area. And so they could actually have it. Um, most of if, if a business through its own org chart cannot make 80% of the decisions on its own, it has to collaborate with other people for every decision, it's an ineffective org structure. Absolutely. 
So if people are so important, what have you learned over your career in terms of um, either skills, capability, soft skills, whatever it may be that is potentially most prescient in figuring out if they're going to be successful or not? Like, what do you look for in people? Uh, I don't think I've had any blinding insight in that you need a combination of skills. I'm in finance. You do need. You need the core skills. Skills. I mean, you can't. The, the person of uh, good judgment and character is not enough. You right. need skills. Um, uh, you need someone, I give bias for action is the usual phrase. Mm. That's my pro change. It's all this bias for action type thing. Um, you need somebody who is, can get along with people and not be the, oh, I, this is a phrase I invented from one of my experiences, who aren't the pineapple juice person. You gotta explain that one. <laughs> if you take fresh pineapple juice and put it in gelatin, it will not gel. There's a chemical in fresh pineapple juice that prevents the gel from gelling. Interesting. The pineapple juice person is the person who prevents the team from gelling because they're always difficult to deal with. When I was at E Trade, the management team there was not gelling. It was it was one person. I pushed this person out, and it was like unbelievable. The ge- it was Jello then, it, you know. It, Were you able to figure out who that person was oh, quickly? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. You knew who the pineapple and juice so, person you know, was. The, who's the pineapple <laughs> juice person? And I still use that phrase because we run into it. Right. There's just people who just make everything difficult. Will always dispute. Will always point fingers. They're the pineapple juice. Have person. you ever hired a pineapple juice person? And did you learn anything from it? Uh, I've not hired a pineapple juice person. Once in a while, someone has a, a little a little juice in them, but not too much. <laughs> okay. So there's no like, gosh, you know what? I made this really bad hire, and here's what I've learned from it. Uh, there's an old line. God knows where I picked it up. Uh, if you hire from outside and they're really successful, fifty percent, more than 50% of the time, you're beating the odds. Yeah. Because you don't know exactly what you're getting. That's the I've challenge. Been, yeah, I've been very lucky. I've done a lot of outside hiring, and I've had, I have almost no failures. Okay, um, maybe I do more due diligence or whatever, uh, or it's more skills based, and you can figure it out than right. other industries. Uh, but I, I, uh, have, I haven't had these big failures. Okay, what about is there? Um, I think um, people, in the name of this podcast, is resilient. People learn most about themselves and and yeah. and enhance themselves as a leader in really troubling or challenging times. Has there ever been a time in your career that you're comfortable sharing? That was a challenge and maybe a learning that came out of it? Well, there have been many challenges. Um, how do you lead in tough times? Yep. That's different than leading in normal times. And with E-Trade, where it was about to fail, that was tough times. Um, when I was a senior vice president, maybe early EVP in banking, in the late 80s is when the LDC debt crisis hit. Now, many of your members not would know that. This is where, in the old days, the American banks had lots of sovereign loans to Latin America and some other LDC countries, and they overborrowed and they got into trouble. Uh, and uh, that crippled the large banks in the world. Uh, at that point, before this started, all the major American banks were AAA rated, and they started getting whacked because of these giant losses. They had overindulged because the notion was this was sovereign debt. Sovereign's ne- Brazil's Brazil. It's not going to be there. Right. But it turns out Brazil doesn't have to pay necessarily. You can't foreclose on Brazil. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard to tow it away. Right. So um, this kind of really hurt the banks and I saw our bank's CEO and that's where I saw it uh, he actually had been a fairly famous football player in college when he was young so he had the right uh, physique you have to have, the CEO has to have broad shoulders hmm. you have to take the angst you can't be the one going oh my god what's going to happen, what's going to happen right. oh, might this. you're the one having to be calm we'll take it in, we'll work on it let's move forward you have to have broad shoulders while other people are losing it a little bit and be the steady rock. And uh, in E-Trade, we were extremely close to going under. That's when you had to have broad shoulders, 
to everybody, <clears throat> but I will tell you, sitting in my home office, working on stuff on a lot of weekends, it was nerve wracking. How did you personally get through that? I mean, just as a leader, I know there's a lot of talk nowadays about you know wellness and and how you manage through stress like that. Was there anything that well, you... let me let me. Uh, I had it somewhat easier than others. This was a reputation issue to me. It was like, if this goes under, I'm toast. No one's ever going to, it's not my, I took it over when it was already weak, but it doesn't matter. Right. You're, you're, you're tarred with it anyway. I'm done. But it was not my net worth hmm. because I, my net worth had been from Jake Morgan Chase and I, it was out. E-Trade I'd just come into. I really feel for the people where it's their long time and it's both their reputation and their net worth. Right. Those people are, you know, they, they, they can't get a job afterwards. Uh, and so it's a real, it's a, a real struggle. So I only had the reputation issue. The answer is you just had to go, I'm in it. I just, when the going gets tough, you just got to get going and push and push uh, uh, and, uh, and work, work hard. Guess what? I had no net worth tied up in this substantially. But it was working weekends uh, in the in the warm weather. I would go play golf once a week just to forget about work for six for five six hours. Wow! But yeah, you, you it was behind. It was all the time, but it wasn't crushing because it wasn't my net worth. So let's go to maybe a lighter and maybe in some regards more important <laughs> topic. topic, which is your involvement with the Partnership for Homelessness. Yes. Why is that important to you? And I'm really actually Excuse interested me, Mike, in. You're the first person who's ever called homelessness a lighter topic. That's actually a good point. And we're going to keep this, meaning you do, people don't usually stop me. You just stop me. So thank you for that. But but why uh, why is it so important um, to you? And and I'd love to hear about you bringing yeah. your kind of quant, not analytical side to it, it looks okay. like. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, to make give interesting stories, I'm going to tell you how I got involved with Partnership yeah. with the Homeless. Okay. So I'm Jewish. I have two boys. Bar mitzvah time comes along. Mm -hmm. We're not the, my wife especially, we're not the fancy type with the giant thousand person affair. We have modest afternoon reception and lunch for a hundred people and that's it. But part of the charitable <clears throat> uh, history of bar mitzvahs is, because the kid gets gifts and gets money, Right. is you will, you're going to donate. They're 13. They still listen to you then. <laughs> By the time they're 17, they don't. I have a 17-year-old daughter, so yeah, I get yeah, what okay. you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> when they're 13, they listen to you. You're going to donate a quarter or a third of this money to a charity. Mm -hmm. Let's pick the charity. And it's what they've had at school or seen, and that's where we want. It was homelessness because they hadn't been involved at school in something. This is the older one. And uh, uh, did some research and... At that point, I was vice chairman of J.P. Morton Chase, got the uh, community group in, check out these charities for me, which ones are good. And that's how I got, we picked really? Partnership for the Homeless. And so because of who I was, the president of the organization came up to see me. But the point was, the kid gave the money. I gave an amount equal to the cost of the whole bar mitzvah to them, too. Now, if you're head of a charity and someone gives you money, you tend to grab onto their hand and not let go <laughs> until you're about dead. So uh, that's how I got into that. And then I joined their board and everything like that. So it's interesting background. Um, the reason I got pulled into it more and more, there's obviously, there's two issues. One is, um, when I got involved, this organization soon thereafter has 25th anniversary. Homelessness was discovered officially as a problem 25 years ago, and this place was founded then. The statistics are just as bad. Or, or worse, maybe, right? Maybe. maybe These yeah. days, this yeah. is a while ago. Oh, okay. It wasn't then. Yeah. And you go, wait, wait a minute. The government has put federal, state, local government, cities, put billions into this. It's no better. And so one of the things I discovered was that a lot of people who worked at Partnership for the Homeless in the ranks. They were empathetic. They really want to solve the problem. They could not uh, organize uh, getting uh, your glasses from here to the door. They had no administrative managerial skills. 
and that was the first time I'd been exposed to people who really are just in a different world. Right. And their skill set is just totally different. Then I discovered that the city, a lot of these were city-run programs. Same problem. They wanted a program that looked good. They had to do it by the next election. And so success, and, and then that commissioner changed. It was a new commissioner, and they changed. And so you have a lot of programs, well-meaning, a lot of money, but not ultimately that effective in addressing homelessness. Um, and the biggest effort was the shelters. Shelters are not solving homelessness. That's just taking care of you in a, in, a, in a not terrible way while you're homeless. Right. Uh, and so uh, it's kind of depressing that this went on. So we tried and made a dent a little bit of let's do better. Let's do some research. Let's figure out underlying causes. Let's be longer term thinking. And the one success out of it is what we, and homelessness is a whole bunch of different, it's a symptom. It's like says you're sneezing. It could be different diseases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a homelessness of a 70 year old is different than a 20 year old single mom with two kids. Um, and we ended up with this, uh, one of the one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York, uh, uh, what we call the Family Resource Center, and it was aimed at the moms with the kids and helping the kids. The public schools were pushing the kids out because they didn't want these homeless kids out of the shelter in their school because it ruined their numbers. And so it was trying to get these moms on the first rung of normal life. So it was getting child care. It was getting them... Uh, it was like being a personal shopper. We're going to with this for your kids, get them into school, get home care, get you training. The problem is they have no skills. Mm -hmm. Get you training so you can get a job. And it was and every one of these underlying programs, they just do their little program. No one puts it together for these people. So that was a one uh, successful area where we made a dent. So uh, change is uh, coming for you. Mm-hmm. I have officially, according to my uh, kids, flunk retirement twice, okay, because I was out and then in. Now, this was not retirement like my father when he was 90 was retired. I was on boards and you do charity stuff and investing. Right. So you're kind of busy. Now, the humor part, though, is so I was in the rat race until I left J. Morgan Chase in um, 2004. E-Trade, I started in 2007. I left there end of 2009. Then I was out until I did the fray job in the middle of 2012. Since I left the bank, I've had the perfect balance of being busy but not. Hmm. The only problem was when I was working full time, I'm too busy. And when I wasn't, I wasn't busy enough. It's hard to maintain activities to keep your neurons going. Uh, and if you find yourself watching Oprah in the afternoon, just jump out the window. You know? <laughs> um or these days, I suppose the equivalent is either Fox News or MSNBC. They go back to uh, depending upon your personal news, yeah. uh, bias, uh, political bias. Um, so you want to find something that's so maybe that I, sweet spot? I, yeah. Or, so yeah. I'm going back to that uh, 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 assembled activities where you still have a lot, you have some life, uh, but not as much pressure. Um, so I assume in there will be one or two boards, although my age is starting to become a constraint versus maximum ages. Uh, I am, the commuting to Washington versus living in New York has made nonprofit work very hard because a lot of them are locally based and I'm never in one place. So I've already started to work on re-engaging in a New York based nonprofit where I'll join their board or in discussions. But I am one of the most knowledgeable people on housing finance at this point, and housing finance policy, when there's still a lot of it up in the air about how it's going to come down. So I want to stay involved in that. And part of that is maybe writing a book about that, not a general book, a book about housing issues. Okay. And um, know what you don't know. I don't know anything about writing a book. I've, I've talked to some people now. I have to decide whether it's going to be a more erudite, policy-oriented, kind of wonky book or the mortgage equivalent of Sex, Lies, and Mortgages or something. I don't <laughs> know. You know. Well, there you got your title. You know, you're, yeah, you, yeah. You know you're, you're more tell-all, zingy. <laughs> it depends what market you're interested in. I'm still working through that. I'm talking whether I should join an affiliate with a think tank part-time. So you, you're part of something that has more of a machine aspect to being involved in it rather than just you doing it, 
or blog posts. So I'm, I'm researching that now, but I got to stay involved. And so uh, I have to use that to influence so things go well. I get a sense that you're not the type that could just sit around too. No, uh, I can't. I, but then you do something <laughs> otherwise. Um, I older than me, friend of mine goes, uh, <laughs> she's been retired a while. She goes, you know, you get up, you read the paper, you go to the club, have lunch, play golf. Pretty soon it's time for cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> you can't peop, old people can stretch the day out no one goes just getting the newspaper down at the store can take two hours at my age you know just because you, you know that's the way you run your life your life will expand I don't want to be Based in on, that until yeah. I'm a medically infirm thank you <laughs> that's not me I have to do something so Don, I, I only have a couple mm -hmm. final questions um, this is one that I actually really enjoyed asking recently and, mm -hmm. and there's kind of a cliche question of always like on what would you define success as? Yeah, this when is I've started to ask your typical interview questions, tell me what your weakness is, exactly. and you answer, "I work too hard." Yes. What, what I found more interesting, though, is if you take that cliche question of what would success look like, and you know all the cliche answers, what would you exclude from your definition of success? Like when you think of success, what is something that you'd say, you know what? I would not include my or this attribute in my definition because of whatever it may be. Okay. Um, in candor to your audience, I knew the questions ahead of time, so I actually had a chance to think about this one. And it maybe the answer betrays the fact that I've spent the last six and a half years in Washington, where while my job is relatively commercial, I am in a political environment. Um, life's a lot better if your success is not part of a zero-sum game. Yours has to be someone else's negative success. Unfortunately, Washington is a lot about, I'm taking you down. I'm up because you're down. I would have a lot of trouble with that life. It's better when success is a, it's for everybody and you move everybody up. It's not at someone else's expense. So that's actually important. So I think what you're, well, reading between the lines, what you're saying is my definition of success would not be just all about me. It cannot mm -hmm. be about what is important to me. It's about how I can actually uplift others. Oh, yeah. And the negative piece would be. Yeah, there is. Okay, success. Financial success is nice regardless of how you get it. But success is a lot sweeter if it's shared and it's part of a big effort and you have friends and you have people you did it with. Um, in these bank mergers, uh, the first merger, uh, our CEO was older. So he it was merger of equals. He stayed as CEO for two years. The guy across the street stepped down for two years and then took over. Mm. That guy who I got, I, I didn't, uh, you know, I was working for him for like, I don't know, nine years, eight years, whatever it was before he retired. Uh, wonderful human being. Uh, he just passed away. He's obviously older. Uh, and the funeral is tomorrow. Mm. And his successor, who was my longtime boss, sent emails out and everything. But he goes it'll be a great opportunity for the old gang to get together and see each other. You tend to split up. And it is. You have a gang. You have right. people you it's have shared tribe. success yeah. with. And it's just, it's, and you want to be with them. And as you get older, you know, being by yourself all the time is not a lot of fun. So having the shared success is definitely the deal. And, and I don't know, some people love going through life, you know, with conquered enemies or something i think if you do like that you go into politics more um uh you don't want to you don't want to run to people who are your mortal enemies it's right. just life's too short for that kind Absolutely. of stuff um it's funny i did see these mergers right manhattan chemical and we took the chemical name then chemical kind of bought chase we took the chase name then we bought jp morgan and did the combo i have people from and i was from manhattan i have people from chemical and chase who still will tell me I am the best boss they ever had. I didn't start with, well, you're from the other bank, you're bad. We did a best of both, just who's good, neutral, less politics. I try to have a less political style than others, and it's part of that team, you know, good people dealing with each other. That's a great answer. Yeah. Um, last question, although mm -hmm. it's two pieces. Um, the name of the podcast is Resilient. What are some attributes of a resilient leader that you've seen in your career? And is there one person, this is the second part, that you would call out and you'd say, 
that was a resilient person and doesn't necessarily need to be somebody in business. It could be anybody that you've come into contact during the course of your life. Uh, what was the first part of the question? The first is um, attributes of a resilient This leader. is not a presidential press conference where you get to ask two questions for one. <laughs> Okay, so what was the first? Let me do one at a time. And we're keeping this. Um, <laughs> attributes of a resilient leader. Like, what What do you think, like, somebody that gets knocked down, like, what is it that allows them to get yeah, back up? And, uh, I, you know, I'm not the expert. I never took a psychology course to know how much it's nurture, nature, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I come back to they take their leadership responsibility seriously. Uh, they know they're being watched. One thing about being CEO, they're watching you. If you, if you, this is an example I like to use when it's T&E time, if you buy the expensive bottle of wine and spend $200 on that, which we would never do with Freddie, but others did, you'd have spent $20,000 because the people seeing this will go do it themselves. You're always being watched when you're the boss. And so uh, part of being a resilient leader is just getting on with it, not sh- again the broad shoulders, and you're being watched, and 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 you the responsibility is the leadership. I love no, but I love that example. You know what's funny? It's the, it's the uh, the impact on the downside of a decision that you make as a leader, and and that two hundred dollar turning into twenty thousand is oh, absolutely. I've never you're being it, yeah. watched. If you are, uh, if if uh, if you leave, if the CEO leaves at five o'clock to go to the driving range, no one's working hard in that company. Yeah. If the CEO is working late, then people will work late. I mean, you you're being watched, um, especially in this era of open plan and glassed in offices. You're literally being watched right. all the time. Right. Um, uh, in terms of resilient leaders. Uh, what comes to mind in that circumstances. Sure. First of all, you'd rather, you'd rather not have the opportunity to be a resilient leader because it usually means something bad happens. You got knocked down, right. <laughs> okay. So you'd rather have the good times. Um, uh, the guy, the CEO who ran Manufacturers Hanover in the LDC debt crisis, uh, he had to be a resilient. He had to have the broad shoulders and just let's get on with it and move and, and solve the problem. The problem became the first modern merger of equals between manufacturers, Hatter, and Chemical. They were copied afterwards. It was the first one. So it was more than just, we'll get on with it, folks. Uh, it's, uh, you know, let's do something about it, thoughtful, and don't overreact, but just do it. And they came up with a solution. So from these two weak banks who had been felled by the LDC debt crisis with single A or maybe even becoming triple B credit ratings, that's who J.P. Morgan Chase yeah. is now, that's despite incredible. the name change. Yeah. Okay. Don, that's, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Is there anything that I maybe didn't ask you or anything that you want to leave us with? That's another one of these with? standard interview questions. No, what no, question didn't I ask? No, no, no. But I want to like, make sure that um, you've had an opportunity to kind of uh, share the things that are important yeah. to you as you're moving out. Uh, all I can say is um, when you're my age, and I'm turning 69 soon, okay, okay? Um, you want to be able to look back your career and feel a lot of satisfaction and pride. And while I never sat and planned it like the Senate career from third grade at Harvard, um, I helped get new businesses started, derivatives business. I was one of the early guys in that. Uh, I was one of the men. You created the nightmares for us accountants then. Yeah, oh yeah. Don't get me started on accounts. FASB and derivatives don't, don't, don't go either well. Um, uh, I played a key role in assembling J.P. Morgan Chase because I was one of, by the time, at the end, I was one of the top three, four people um, uh, doing that. But then when it became just not commercial, saving a company like E Trade, that's 5,000 people who didn't lose their jobs. Right. Okay. Uh, and maybe clients who didn't lose some of their money in a bankruptcy because that's not a minor affair either uh and then when the calling came and the opportunity was there i'm doing more of my public service job and the financial system is better for me having been at freddie for the last six years I'm, it's not all due to me but i don't want to claim that in any way but the people in it know it's all uh, i was a key driver of a lot of the changes 
And so you get to feel pretty good about that. It's a great way to end it. Thank you, Don. Yeah, good. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. Hopefully everybody listening enjoyed that as much as I did. Don, let me pause for a second and thank you. You gave some incredible insights, insights on turning around a company in troubled times, how Freddie Mac is helping transform its business to create more home ownership opportunities for people in the United States and insights on how to lead in good times and in bad times. Thank you to all who subscribe and listen to Resilient, a Deloitte podcast produced by our friends at Rivet Radio. You can find us on Deloitte.com or by visiting your favorite podcatcher, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and even Spotify, keyword Resilient. Check out previous episodes, great interviews with CEOs, board members, and leaders. And if you like my conversation with Dawn, go back and check out my conversation with Daryl Brewster, the former CEO of Krispy Kreme and the current CEO of CECP. Much like Don, Daryl is guided by a deep sense of purpose on how organizations can improve the lives of all people. And if you are enjoying these conversations, please share them with work colleagues, family, and friends. And I'd be extremely grateful if you could spend just one minute with a rating. Ratings play such a large role in how the podcast gets promoted in places like iTunes. And hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter. Just flying out to New York yesterday, I got three messages, three direct messages on LinkedIn. People talking about my interview with Shelly Archibald. So if you have any comments, questions, recommendations, definitely send me a message. I will respond back. My profile in LinkedIn is under Michael Kearney. If you're looking for me in Twitter, it's mkearney33. Let me leave you with a quote from Pablo Picasso that I really think encapsulates the essence of dawn and giving back. The quote goes as follows. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. <laughs>